Rust is well known for being a systems programming language that enables writing higher performance programs with fewer resources. Due to this and the way the language models errors and other facets, I would contend that writing APIs is a core use case for Rust. In this video, we'll pick a Rust web framework to build a JSON API. This video, like the video before it where we chose a database, is part of a series to find out if Rust and Wasm are ready for production, real world, revenue generating use cases. The Rust ecosystem has a penchant for are we X yet domains. And as it turns out, there is an are we web yet domain for the web ecosystem. All of the options listed on this site today are more pick your own pieces rather than Rails, which is fine for our use case today. I'm gonna to choose a framework called Axum that is newer than any of the ones listed currently. And I'm a firm believer that each of these frameworks is just as good of a choice. And a lot of the differences can be ascribed to a personal preference or choice. So today I'm gonna to cover why Axum and what makes Axum different rather than why not any of these other frameworks. The main reason I chose Axum is because it includes a bevy-like query API that uses extractors to get information from the request. And I've come to really enjoy the API that bevy offers when it comes to accessing resources. And the way Axum has implemented this in an HTTP framework is really nice. For example, you can just drop a few arguments into an async function and you're off to the races routing your requests. The second reason is that Axum has a really deep integration with Tokyo and the tower service trait. Fully covering Tower's service trait is probably the topic of another video. So suffice it to say that this deep integration means that you can access the ecosystem of sort of middlewares and other routing functionality, such as timeouts, rate limiting, load balancing, and anything else you wanna write. Many of this middleware or additional routing service functionality already exists and can be shared between Axum and other frameworks. So with the data migrated in our last video and our web framework of choice, chosen, it's time to actually build the API. The previous iteration of this API was built on top of AWS AppSync's GraphQL support, but I decided to not go to GraphQL this time. And to be honest, it's not actually the fault of GraphQL. I actually really just want to remove AWS Amplify from my project and reduce the page weight that my users have to incur when they load the page. The core benefits of AWS's AppSync GraphQL implementation was deep integration with data storage like DynamoDB. But since I'm moving away from AWS anyway, I've already given that up with my choice to move to PlanetScale, since PlanetScale, of course, doesn't have a deep integration with AWS AppSync. The other big reason that I liked AWS AppSync was its deep integration with Cognito, but I'm going to have to solve that problem anyway because I've chosen to move some things away from AWS already, which means I have to figure out how to interface with Cognito on my own. There are a bajillion examples, and yes, that's a real number, in the Axum GitHub repo, so it would be really hard for me to deny myself one of these as a starting point for or the code that I want to write. I chose to modify the SQLX Postgres example as it's the closest to what I actually want in the end, which is SQLX and MySQL. This required installing the Tokyo Tracing Crate, which is fine because that's what I'm going to use to monitor and observe my services anyway. There were some conventions in the example that I either didn't agree with or didn't need, such as needing to fall back to a local database if the remote database wasn't set. I don't really want my production application to try to access a local database if I forget to set the environment variable. I just want it to crash, so I removed that. There's also some fixes that will have to come later, such as replacing socket adder, which if, for example, if I choose to use fly.io's internal networking, I will have to change anyway. I set up a throwaway route to test the connection and to make sure I had to write a little bit of integration code to actually make sure that we are connecting to the database successfully and retrieving some data. This makes sure that the actual service that we're going to deploy can do everything we need, including accept a request, make a connection to the database, return some data, and return that to the user. We have two choices when it comes to extracting the connection pool from the request information. We can either extract the entire pool, which can be valid in certain use cases, or we can extract just a specific connection, which will require us to write a little bit of integration code, but means that we can just get a connection anytime one of these handlers is wrong. One trick that I really like when using SQL X is that we can write SQL as separate files, which allows me to use all of the nice features of my editor, such as code highlighting and autocomplete. And I'm not much of an ORM person anyway, so I enjoy using the full force of whatever my editor can do with SQL files. All these files get compile time checked anyway against the database, so we need to have the database actually connected for our Rust program to compile and be able to check them. 
With that setup out of the way, it was time to run the server and see what happens. I set up a generic API response, so I was able to use that to see a successful JSON response with a data and an error field. This included some of the data from the workshops in the database, showing me a couple of the ones that are on the site already. So, so far so good, we've got the API working and the database working. In the next video, we're gonna have to actually pick a place to host the API and then actually deploy it. So leave a comment with your favorite host for Rust code and maybe we'll see it in the next video. Have a great rest of your day.